So, and I'll just kick off the discussion. This is actually the third session of just an hour that we've held on the Learning Futures Collaboratives. The uh, Learning Futures Collaboratives, the LFCs are intended to meet goals of developing future-focused, idea-driven, high-impact research agendas among Mary Lou Fulton faculty and graduate students, as well as folks beyond the college. So these are all-inclusive groups around big questions that are important for education. Um, the way we've been structuring these sessions, we have six LFCs. Each, um, each session, we've focused on two. So this week, we're, we've invited representatives from a Learning Futures Collaborative focused on imaginations and future thinking. That's the one we were talking about, Michelle, and hopefully Rebecca and Robin can also jump in and respond to some questions. The second LFC that's represented here is um, entitled OASIS is the acronym. It's Optimizing Access for Students in Schools. And our guests are Kathy Hoffman and Aaron Rothram Fuller. So they are representing and also they're also the leads of that particular LFC. So we thought we would start by asking these representatives to briefly introduce themselves and just say a little bit about your LFC, um, sort of more, a little more information about the focus and maybe a little bit of information about some of the activities you're, you're engaged in. So um, so why don't I start with Kathy and Aaron to kick us off? Would you start by giving some information about your LFC? Um, absolutely, we'd be happy to. And I did prepare some slides, so but would, I, um, would you be able to give me sharing? capacity to share my slides. All right, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for taking some time to hear about, this is the newest LFC, Project Oasis. And I'm Kathy Hoffman. Um, I started my career working in Arizona's public schools as a speech language pathologist, working in special education, then spent the last four years as Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction before coming here to Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College to um, refocus my energy on special education. Erin? Sorry, I have too many screens finding out where to mute. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Erin Roth from Fuller, and I'm a faculty here in the college. And most of my work and specialization is around special education um, and autism in particular, um, but getting to expand a little bit about that around the whole field of special education now. Um, so just to give a high level overview of Project Oasis and the LFC, our big, bold, future-focused question, we wanted um, broadly, you know, where we started was thinking about the future of special education. But as we were um, digging into what is the future of special education, we um, we came up with this guiding future focus question. Basically, what would the optimal school system look like in which special education is not necessary and in which labeling disabilities is not necessary for all students to be thriving and to be successful? So of course, this is a, a big question, not something we could possibly answer today or this year, but um, but we think it's really important to be, you know, just despite all the challenges in special education, that we, we want to be solutions focused, we want to be data driven. And so um, we're really honored that in our Learning Futures Collaborative, we've been able to convene uh, over 100 people now that are from all over Arizona, we have educators, school leaders, people from the business community, nonprofit leaders, people with disabilities, all coming together to be thinking about the future of special education across many different areas, of course, because special education is very broad and very diverse. Um, so with this uh, group of, um, oh, and I should mention, we have several people from the LFC that I noticed are on the call today. So we, ha we do have several, I actually, quite a few ASU faculty and doctoral students who are also engaged in this work. So we're very grateful for that support as well. Um, so the, within, so I, we tend to describe Project Oasis as, as having two main arms. There's the collaborative arm and then there's the research arm. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we've been engaging this, um, this group, this big collaborative around our um, topics of interest. And then, Aaron, and then I'll pass it to Aaron to talk more about the research side. So um, we've been bringing the people together, uh, first and foremost, to be learning from each other and for us to be hearing directly from 
the field, but across the whole spectrum, birth through adulthood and workplace. And we're creating opportunities for the collaborative to be learning about some of the bright spots that are happening in Arizona. So we're planning a school tour, a, a district tour down to the Vail School District, which has an inclusive program for students with disabilities, meaning even students with really severe disabilities are integrated into the general education classroom. We're planning to highlight the United Sound program, which is a nonprofit. Um, this is actually, a, they actually work across the country, but they are um, active in several school districts across the state, including the Gilbert School District. And the um, purpose and mission of United Sound is to create peer-to-peer um, mentoring types of relationships in music. So they have um, students without disabilities working with students who have disabilities to teach them to play musical instruments and to be a part of their school band. And it's um, really, really awesome program. Then um, we're working with First Place, which is a um, residential place for, they primarily serve adults with autism, but they, but they um, work with other adults with disabilities as well. They help with career developing skills and independent living. Um, so we wanna also make sure we're connecting our work to not just the K-12 system, but where are our students with disabilities? Like where are they going and how can we um, ensure their future success as they become adults? Um, the Learning Futures Collaborative also hosts study sessions. So these are more webinar um, style like on Zoom where we've had presentations from the Next Education Workforce. And then we also, we did go in person. This was a hybrid event where we went in person to the Decision Center, which is pictured there, where we were able to look at statewide data and basically do a data dig um, with the Decision Center. Um, just as another way, again, so really trying to connect our work in the LFC to the data that exists and to be having discussions that are solutions focused and really uh, focused on highlighting what's working well and and then like what are our next steps to be able to scale up some of these best practices as well. So we we have these kind of two arms where we we have the collaborative and we have the the research side, but we're trying to make them very much built off of each other. So we're trying to come up with research that supports what our collaborative members are coming and saying they need and talking about as challenges um, and wanting some solutions too. So some of that starts with the study sessions and the um, and the site visits that Kathy just talked about, and some of it is um, building on more formal research projects. Um, but we, you know, it, it's an ambitious uh, idea to take on from the beginning of educator and teacher prep to all the way to getting our, you know, students with disabilities into the workforce and into their life. And that's kind of the continuum of different projects that we've um, started to look at because that's what our collaborative brings. So we, you know, if we have employers who want supports on how to um, better adapt their settings for individuals with disabilities, and we have, you know, um, educator prep and, and thinking about how do we train, support, and retain um, our special ed teachers and um, and help all gen ed teachers understand the needs of all kids. And so we have four examples of different projects that we're currently working on now where we're looking at secondary data analysis on some of the next education workforce data. Um, we're also um, looking at that teaming model and seeing how is it um, supporting students with disabilities in, in the district. Um, we have a new partnership project where we're just trying to develop with Dublin City University, where we're going more in depth into special ed classrooms here and in Ireland to see kind of what's working in both places. Um, we're looking at the Vale School District and their you know inclusion model and what's working for kids in um, with disabilities in, in those settings, as well as what's working for the general education students in that setting and how it can be uh, helpful for both for everybody to be in the same place. And then we also have a workforce pipeline skill um, project where we're trying to see what employer supports we need and what educational supports we need to get um, more to help 
individuals with disabilities be more independent and um, get into the workforce. So, you know, a wide, wide range of things and a lot of our faculty are involved and a lot of our doc students are involved. And we love that um, it's it's been an umbrella to bring people together to get to all uh, share expertise, share experiences and build on that. And we are um, we are definitely taking all comers, anybody who's interested, because there's so many things, um, so many different avenues that people are trying to tackle. So for our future, um, you know, we're just, we have really uh, low goals to just change the entire field. And <laughs> we we want to, you know, we want to find the, the structures and the supports in schools for teachers and for students. Ultimately, we want our teachers to feel um, valued and respected and engaged and excited. And we want our students to come out feeling that same way about their educational process. And so now it's just a matter of building all of this infrastructure to help make that happen. Thanks so much, Kathy and Erin. Um, I'm always blown away when I hear you talk about everything that you've been doing in particularly such a short time. As um, as Kathy and Erin mentioned, they're the newest of our LFCs, but certainly not um, not slacking off. They've, they're a really good example of the wide variety of activities that LFCs are engaging in. So thanks so much for that overview. Thank you. So let's move to, I don't think Michelle has joined us yet. Um, Rebecca and Robin, would you mind introducing yourselves and giving us an overview of your LFC? And don't worry that you don't have slides. That was not necessarily required. So um, it's fine for you to just do a verbal description. So thanks. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, you guys did give a wonderful presentation just now and I was like, oh no, I'm going by the seat of my pants, but this is gonna be fun. Um, I'm Rebecca John Gord. I'm a third year liter learning literacies and technologies PhD student. Um, and I have been sort of peripheral to this particular um, Learning Futures Collaborative um, last year. And then I joined this year. Um, but in, I'll let Robin introduce herself, but in just a minute, I'll try to give you a summary of both of what they have been up to and, and where we're looking for the coming year as well. Um, and I, I invited Robin, I kind of pulled her in and she also may be kind of surprised because I was like, you can just go and watch and I thought you'd want to come. Um, but she's also pretty much our newest member. So Robin. Hi. Yeah, I, I just I'm really just sort of a guest here because I'm just. I just joined like a few, you know, about a month ago, right? And I'm just learning what this is all about. Um, but I guess the reason I'm part of this think tank, I guess you want to call it, is because um, I taught, well, actually, I taught um, Rebecca's daughter, actually, a few years ago. She was my student. And I taught gifted students for many years. And, um, and I did a lot of every year I would incorporate future studies that I would bring in. Um, I would go out to workshops, figure stuff out, bring stuff into the classroom and incorporate that into my classroom every year. So for like for the past 20 years. So um, I'm just fascinated by like, what does the future hold? So that's really where I'm at. So yeah, that's it. So uh, if I can just jump in for a quick second. Um, so one of the things that I found most interesting when the proposal was, you know, when uh, Ruth Wiley reached out to me and said, we are proposing an LFC. And the way she articulated it was what really struck with me. So she said, you know, we teach history, but our children are going to live in the future. So <clears throat> how do we think about making that continuity so that we are both grounded in our histories? Of course, that is critically important, but that we always have our eyes on the future. And that reminded me of this quote that Jawaharlal Nehru who was the first uh, prime minister of India. And he, and after independence, he often talked about the fact that our feet are rooted in our history. We are living in the present, but our eyes are always on the future. And I've always found that idea behind the future's thinking uh, to be quite provocative um, as a way of thinking about our curriculum, you know, that the, the curriculum, and specifically when we talk about history, we are always looking backward, but really the line should be looking forward. I thought I would just share that because I, I, I remember talking with Ruth about it and being very, uh, very sort of impressed by that, that articulation of it. Yeah. And to add to that and to, and to go with what Robin was talking about as well, exactly what you said, we focus on history a lot. We try, we hope to teach our, our children history, but we're trying to prepare them for the future as well. That's what we, we always say we are to be certain types of participants in 
the society or societies of the future. And so we think that it's very important and what Robin has done with her classes that people actually do start to um, intentionally do some futures thinking and and help their students. And that involves imagination. Um, And I want to emphasize, and again, I don't know how much I know this the LFCs have been around for for at least a year. And so um, maybe you've already heard this before, but we call it futures thinking because there is no one future right now, right? There is sometimes the tendency, especially for um, young people to sort of see the future as something unchangeable and not within their control. But the idea of this this particular LFC is to to look at, well, what are the futures that are possible, probable um, and preferred And how do we work together collaboratively with kind of an imagination of what the future could be to try to shape it and try to bring in as as many um, participants into that imagining of the future and possible futures together? Um, And I would you like me to say more about some of the activities that collaborative has been up to? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Okay. so. They have been in, in with that intention of trying to reach out as we all are in our collaboratives, right? Trying to take research, but reach out to the larger community and um, put some theory into action. Um, They have been developing some relationships outside of the um, uh, Center for Science and the Imagination. And one of those is with the um, city of Guadalupe, which is a very small like city embedded within the Phoenix area um, with a high indigenous and Hispanic population. And they are doing some co-design um, with that town to try to um, do some futures thinking with the, with that city about what they want their future to look like, and particularly in terms of um, sustainability and energy futures. So they are trying to make that also a intergenerational activity. So they've been bringing together elders from that community and youth from that community and trying to have some um, activities together where they do some imagining and both um storytelling and futures thinking together. Um, And that's an ongoing partnership that is still kind of nascent, but that's one of the big ones that we're working on. Um, Another thing that we're doing is trying to, we're we're putting a proposal forth for a grant for a conference. So an imagination and futures thinking um, conference, because that's not something that's on a lot of people's radar yet. It's kind of um, an interesting one, I think, to convince people there's a need for. Maybe it'll be a festival. It's it's something that I think could be a lot of fun, though, um, and trying to get this whole idea of, of futures thinking being something that people incorporate into their schools as, as something important. Um, we've also developed in the past year a few different um, futures thinking games. Um, so, to, again, I think to try to get people's imaginations when you get into that world of play and creativity, um, and I know some of you can speak to that much more than I can, but um, getting people's imaginations into the activities of thinking about things, especially that might be fear inducing for a lot of people. Um, we sometimes feel helpless about the future. We don't, you know, it. we can't see it, uh, but we can. So, but if we get into play a little bit and imagine possible futures and also reimagine the pasts and think about where imagined pasts might have taken us in different directions than than we have gone um that sort of loosens people's thinking up a little bit to to think about creative solutions um to the the issues that we face um and i get so those are in my mind some of the the three main things proposing a conference working with the the people of guadalupe and sort of a co-design um position there and then also creating several different games that we've been um uh running with small groups and some teachers in the summer and working on developing a little bit more this year with teachers. Um, Also, I wanted to just touch on, though, reaching out to the community. And I think I'm wondering if this has been like to what extent this is a challenge to the different um, uh, futures collaboratives, Um, although it sounds like uh, uh, Kathy, you guys can talk to that a little bit more because you have had a lot of um, involvement in yours, but just how we share what we're doing with a larger um, community and an intergenerational community. So Robin is uh, uh, has joined our group. And then um, we did have some youth join one meeting that I went to last year, and then also a, a couple of meetings ago. And I will say that that was my daughter who was the youth that joined, but we would love to be able to have, she was, she loved being there. And it surprised me because we were not talking about 
always talking about kid-friendly things, but she was really glad that she had spent her last day of fall break there. So um, I guess that's an open question, though, to ha how the rest of the um, Learning Futures Collaboratives are involving the community and, and doing so intergenerationally. That's a great question, Rebecca. And actually, why don't we pivot a bit? Kathy and Erin, do you have anything to respond to in relationship to that question? Definitely. I I think um, I didn't really think about it in terms of intergenerationally, although I think we have some. Um, I don't I don't know if we've completely checked that box. Um, the way that we're thinking about engaging students is more through having um, like when we do the school tours or some of these webinars to be able to bring student voices in in that way, just because they they probably wouldn't be able to come to too many of the meetings with their with their school schedules. Um, but that is something we've um, definitely thought about is how do we make sure we have student voice as a part of it and the, and the youth voice specifically. So that's definitely something we're mindful of, but I hadn't really thought about it quite in those terms. Well, and I would say one of the things that the LFC has done is it's allowed us to put the community at the center for ours um, because they are the ones that are kind of driving the questions and the, the activities that we want to do. So when they came and said, okay, well, you know, we don't understand what's happening and, and what these outcomes are from, you know, the, the LRE, that least restrictive environment. So now we're like, okay, well, let's go find some data on what's happening with least restrictive environment. That wasn't like a, a question that we were generating as faculty or, you know, as experts, we're saying, okay, what are the problems you have? Let's go answer those. Um, and I like that the community stays at that at that center um, and, and that we can, you know, just have that, that interaction and that communication um, because we, you know, we don't want to solve problems they don't have and we, <laughs> we, and just give information that isn't as necessary. So I like that focus. Great. Thanks. Um, great ideas. Uh, so why don't we switch back? Well, actually we can stay with Kathy and Erin. Um, and one of the questions that we did prepare that we gave you ahead of time um, is what has the LFC allowed you to do that you believe is different from other research or other projects that you are a part of? Um, and in particular, in the case of OASIS, what is new about what you're planning to do in your opinion? So Erin or Kathy? Erin should take that first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, so Oasis has um, is kind of provided an umbrella for us to to gather around our research expertise and and kind of contribute together. Um, a lot of times we've we've done our own independent lines of research. I think within special education, and we we each have um, expertise in in somewhat related but slightly different places. And now we kind of have an opportunity to make it bigger, um, to answer bigger questions, to um, you know to think about things in a slightly different way than how do we piecemeal, like let's uh, test this intervention or let's look at this school or answer this one question um, because now we can answer bigger questions that are gonna be more um, applicable and have bigger impact to more places. Um, so I think the LFC has definitely given us that platform. Um, and especially given that we have so many collaborators, it's also given us a lot of access um, and, and opportunities for, for that impact to be seen in, in real places. And, um, you know, working with multiple school districts, we have five partner districts that are like, sure, come on and do research, which usually that's a battle just in itself to be able to get research done. <laughs> so um, so that, that kind of um, access and opportunity has been huge. Well, great. Kathy, anything to add or? No. Um, so Rebecca, uh, same same question for you. What do you feel like the LFC has allowed you to do or your group to do that you think is different from other projects, research projects that you've been a part of? I think this is a, um, it's a it has great potential for outreach, but of course we want to do that with our research anyway. So I guess for me, something that makes it different is that it is uh, playful. Um, that even though we're, you know, serious about doing good work and good research um, and thinking seriously about about 
the issues, it, it, it invite it, when you're talking about the imagination, if you're not being a little bit playful, I think you'd be in trouble. So um, the work that we can, that we do with people does not also have to all be focused on sort of outcomes and assessment and following the standards. Although I'm mean, obviously, actually, I know, and Robin may have something to add about this. You do always have to incorporate that sort of thing, but you can also incorporate play. Um, so I guess that's what I'd call serious play. And I don't have that opportunity so often. So. Well, and you think the LFC structure in particular contributed to that in addition to the focus of your LFC? I I think that it can because, I mean, I guess I think the LFC is going to be shaped very much by whoever is leading it and in it, which is one of the good things, right? Uh, very participatory. Um, but I think it can because it offers that um, sort of collegial, friendly atmosphere to to step away from maybe normal roles um, that we might have in the in the academic community or or elsewhere. Cool. Very cool. Um, I hadn't thought about that before in relationship to the LFC. So that's a really nice addition. Um, Funya, did you want to jump in and ask a question or? Sure. Um, so first, a quick comment. I think, Rebecca, the point you made about that it's going to be influenced a lot by the group. And I think that, you know, when we did the year two kickoff of the LFCs, uh, in a, you know, back in August, um, you know, in, in person in pain, um, that was one thing that sort of stood out. I think Betty and I sort of discussed that, which is that by giving very little structure, so saying like, let this be what you want it to be, I think has really allowed the LFCs to grow in their own ways. And I think they're quite different from each other because of that. Um, and you can just look across them and you'll see um, just a great diversity, like what OSS does from versus what you do versus the refugee immigrant um, LFC is doing, what the AI LFC is doing. They just vary quite dramatically. But what strikes out again is how productive they are, you know, for very... I mean, I, I'm ashamed how insufficient resources we are able to provide to make kick these things off, but that's sort of a constraint that we live under. Um, but I think that's a really powerful uh, point that I think I, I, I appreciate your sort of mentioning that. So um, in terms of the question, and I'll start with Rebecca with you, just because to shift things around a bit. Um, one of the reasons for creating the LFCs has been to bring sort of diverse perspectives, theoretical frames, disciplinary expertise, methodologies, and so on to what we broadly call complex problems of education. And in your case, futures thinking, um, how do you think that, that, that the LFCs have been successful in that regard? Uh, how do you think that has worked out? Well, I think that it is, I think we're all in a state of becoming in these LFCs. And yes, I, I think that um, for me, at least being exposed to people, some people outside of MLFTC um, and the Center for the Science for Science and the Imagination, but also people in media in sustainability. Um, so that has been really nice. Yeah, it does. It does um, expose us to people in, in different disciplines, which is so important. I would love to know more about how to do that even more. And I will say that one thing that I think is difficult is that when we're in um, academia and we're looking at this uh, on an academic sort of time frame and with academic hierarchies and ways of functioning, the challenge then is to find events or venues or times when you are not when the people who are in academia are not necessarily the ones leading or pushing. I don't know. This is like an open question. I don't know how to approach it. But like, how do you how do you shift from all right? We're doing academic work, but we don't need to keep the same academic procedures, processes, or ways of relating um, if we're going to broaden this to more participants. Or maybe I'm wrong about that. And Robin, you could speak to that. Maybe it's fun to like. To come into the to this world at ASU, that's a little different from the world outside of ASU. I don't know if that even makes sense. So, what is your question to me? Is it should we get other people involved that are not well? That's in an the world? it's it's an ongoing question. I think for for any mm -hmm. group if coming from a university who's like we want to get the public involved. How do you get the public involved in such a way that it's not that it's that it's um, even more than inclusive that the public can push forward agendas and that it's not. How do you do research while also not, I guess, um, 
alienating people who don't maybe do research or talk in the same way that the vocab, whatever, the way of talking, the vocabulary that um, we often have in universities. And I, that may, and then my question for you, Robin, was like, do you, or do you prefer, do you like coming into a setting where people are using all these like acronyms and talking about grant writing or what, what pulls you, what pulls you in? Is that like a curiosity for you or is it more like, eh, I don't, I, yeah. I like, I like people who use, you know, large vocabulary. So I'm a little odd, but uh, um, I think if you're, if you're talking about thinking about the future, right. Um, I think you have to get some other people involved, right? Because like we talked about this, I don't think you were at the last meeting and we were talking about, you know, um, like what what do people in say Guadalupe where, that where we're going, which is a, a you know, a, f a fairly lower SES, um, highly, uh, <clears throat> highly um, Hispanic, or I don't know what the word is anymore, um, highly Hispanic neighborhood, right? And so one of the young men who was there, he said, well, you know, it's not necessarily, a lot of these things that we talk about are not necessarily relevant to them because they don't live in our world, right? And so I think like, I love talking about lofty, philosophical, avant-garde things, but if, if you're gonna really like open the conversation up, I think you need to have people who are not academics. You know what I mean? You have to you have to have a little bit of that sprinkled in there. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of us with, you know, great minds coming together talking about things that you know, may or may not have any relevance to the real world. That's that's my thought. Yeah, I I think that's that's a really good point and Rebecca, I think you bring up really important issue because sometimes it can sort of reek of tokenism, right? Which is like, oh, we did get the community voice. And I think that's a tension, which I'm not sure like higher ed or, you know, as a collective we have ever resolved or whether it's one that is an essential tension that needs to remain because there's value in both sides of things. And sometimes these essential tensions play an important role in as we negotiate them, that it opens up ways of thinking, right? That's another way of possibly thinking about it. So, uh, Kathy, I'm going to turn to you. I mean, you're coming into sort of a higher ed, and now you're thrown in with all these, uh, as Rebecca said, acronyms or long words, but you come in from the world of practice, you come in from the world of policy. How has that transition been, and how has this LFC sort of helped uh, you navigate that? And like, how many little cheat sheets that Aaron give you about this is what this means in higher ed. This is when we say this, we actually mean that, you know? Well, coming from K-12, I'm no stranger to acronyms, but yeah, definitely had to learn some new ones. Um, but I, I think it's been incredibly helpful partnering with Aaron on this, um, especially on the research side. I feel like we've been able to uh, pursue and accomplish so much more than I even ever really imagined being a, being possible with the LFC um, until we had, and, you know, thankfully Aaron came on board as my partner pretty, pretty early on. So um, it's been incredibly helpful. And um, between Aaron and a few other of the teacher college faculty, I've, I refer to them as my cultural liaisons as well, because there's definitely a, a culture to ASU um, in the teacher's college that, you know, it just takes, like at any new job, it takes a little bit of time. But I do think it's a strength that I had so many relationships all around Arizona that a lot a lot of people wanted to engage in this project. And and then as I shared about Project Oasis out with, um, with people in the field and in the community, uh, the, I'm just so grateful that it, it's very affirming that that there is a need for this type of work that, um, and that's why the, you know, I, I, I didn't plan for the LFC to be a hundred plus people, but it's, it, people are really seeing the need. And then they're also networking with each other and building relationships within the LFC, not just with ASU, but also with each other and learning about resources and um, what's happening in other school communities. Thank you. Erin, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I I would say, you know, Kathy coming in with all of this network already and, and being able to, you know, to excite people about it all around the community has kind of shifted more than just the research side um, and the way that we bring in those methodologies and the, you know, kind of diverse perspectives. Um, 
to, you know, to a very different conversation. Um, but we also still have 21 researchers here between the doc students and the faculty that are, we're engaged every two weeks. We're, we're having meetings and moving projects and doing things. So, you know, like it kind of has inspired and, and moved things along in, in both realms, which is kind of cool because that really does make it a diverse conversation as opposed to, you know, this is how we talk and this is what we do. <laughs> Right. No, and I can I can attest to Kathy's network. I mean, she snaps her fingers and she has a superintendent's round table of like 40 people in a room, you know, and then so that that's hard to do. I mean, these are busy people yes. and you have to have their trust and, and faith to say, oh, we are trying to do something here today. So you just come by and, you know, and to give their entire like three fourths of a day, you know. So thank you for that. Betty, do you want to kick us off to the next question? Sure. Yeah. And maybe we'll stick with Kathy and Erin for the moment, um, since it follows from your description of how many people you have involved. But uh, so what are some strategies that your LFC uses to sort of keep on task and keep all these people moving forward in similar or related directions? Um, it is a lot of logistics, which I do think is one of one of my strengths is scheduling project management type types of skills. And then we we hired a graduate student. She's actually a first year student from the speech and hearing department. Um, so future, future SLP. So that's been really helpful with helping with some of those, um, with some of our other paths, like she's doing some literature review for us as well. Um, but I, I, I think it just takes a lot of communication and organization. Um, and I use Trello as a way to even think about like from month to month, is one way that I sort my ideas, just one organizational tool that's out there. And um, and we're starting to have clearer buckets, like you saw in the slides. I, the, the buckets weren't as clear to us in the beginning, but now after hearing more and more from the LFC and their questions that are being generated and um, the different areas that seem to need the most attention, we're, now we have those buckets and, and so we can start to see like, well, which bucket needs more attention? Like where, you know, how can we, and then we're, and then we're in our next meeting with the LFC, which is in about two weeks, we're planning to have them tackle the buckets and help us to think through like, what are some other um, like programs we could highlight or, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's, or maybe we're almost ready to start looking outside of Arizona. Um, so those are some of my thoughts, Erin. Well, it, I agree. It's all communication and organization. Um, but so we all know that faculty can sometimes be hard to get in the same place at the same time. Um, we uh, we have a standing meeting every two weeks, um, and that's our research meeting. And and I um, I planned that for thirty minutes every time because I know that we can't do even just an hour. I know how hard it is to get everybody here just an hour. So we do 30 minute check ins um, and it really is like a status report. OK, this project's happening, this happening, this community member is interested in this. Who wants to take it? And we start to distribute some of those um, activities and everybody kind of takes on their own projects. So and we're hoping that more will take more leadership because right now, Kathy and I are kind of doing a lot of the steps on those each of those projects. But the more we can get other people to kind of take on those things, it can be a status report on all the projects. It's a lot easier. So, um, so yeah, that's how we, we stay on top of it, but, um, there are many, many moving pieces. So it's just a lot of, uh, a lot of checking in and a lot of communication. Great. Yeah. That does seem crucial to any kind of group that communication and the distributed leadership sort of model, I think often just helps build every in the group too, um, because they, you know, they feel more responsible for what's happening. Um, and just an aside, Kathy, when you mentioned reaching beyond Arizona or ready, I just got this image of Kathy, like leading this global group um, to transform uh, special education. So kudos to you. Um, so Rebecca and Robin, um, what strategies has your group used to keep on task and kind of stay aligned um, and move forward? Um, well, we also meet uh, twice a month uh, on the second and fourth um, uh, Fridays of each month. And our meetings are, um, the way we do that is we have lunch together first, which is is a wonderful, again, I think that helps with the 
collegial aspect of it. We just have lunch. And then we um, usually have been doing some kind of a little bit of more preform activity, something to kind of get us, again, sort of thinking creatively or thinking about the future or using techniques that we might use with um, people we're working with. Um, then we have short reports on the projects people are doing. Um, and then we try to have at least an hour, sometimes up to two hours of, of work time on those different projects. Um, and then people who are involved with those different projects also have to have um, additional meeting times. Um, as far as like, I think you're also thinking, you're asking like, how do you stay on task? How do you stay focused on your kind of your mission? And I think that just involves a, like a, I think that's part of what we're doing when we do the um, activities that are a little bit more free form, but then come back to talking about, well, what are our projects going to be? Um, because that the, our projects are are shifting or our, our um, I guess, ideas about the projects or the topics are shifting. So as long as I think there's just the, like um, sort of a design process of um, focusing in on what we want to do and our goals that are concrete and then thinking divergently and going out and sort of saying things like, well, what if we did this? Let's put that somewhere, that idea somewhere, and then coming back and focusing on the projects at hand. I don't know if that answers your question. but Yeah, great. Um... Yeah, really good. Yeah. So um, I like the, you know, the idea that you are evolving in what you want to do um, and that the the group recognizes the need to be flexible and that yet still, you know, remains somewhat aligned with the original conception. So, so yeah. So Punya, you want to take another question? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so one of the purposes of the LFCs was to bring more sort of doctoral students involved uh, in this. And Rebecca, the fact that you are here representing the, the LFC speaks that to a certain extent, for sure, it has been successful. And I think we had the same thing with the refugee and immigrant education as well, uh, with the doc students representing the group. So that's great. Um, what are some challenges that you have faced in this? Um, and what are some ways that you think this has been helpful uh, or possible to include doctoral students? Because part of it is also sort of developing our next generation of scholars who think in these interdisciplinary ways, who think in these more complementary and sophisticated ways. So anybody can jump in. Rebecca, maybe you can speak to your, because you said initially you were sort of peripherally involved and now you jumped in. So what made that, that process happen? Yeah. So, and I, I will say that I don't, I think that the grad students from the start have been, have jumped in. The ones who were there last year knew that they, you know, wanted to do imagination and futures thinking. They were in. And I, that's something that Michelle mentioned to me earlier when we were talking about this is that for her as a professor, it's been really um, sort of generative to have this opportunity to just collaborate in a way that is maybe not as um, I don't know, not as top down or where the relationships are not, you know, Michelle's my advisor, but, uh, and that, that's not why I go. And also she's working with other grad students who are not her advisees that she just has that opportunity to kind of, for things to sort of be, I guess, cross pollinated. Um, I think what makes it something that people want to go to is because is when they have a voice and they know they may be able to hop on to some to a project that's already going on that that maybe a professor is working on, but they also actually know they can themselves put forward projects and somebody might say, oh, I want to work with you on that in a way that maybe we don't always in, in other, um, maybe it's not quite as easy to do at other times. And the fact that it's not just professors and grad students, but that it's also other community members um, and um but I will also say, so that's been good. It really does feel like there's a lot of collaboration that can happen. And I think that's important and that some grad students can kind of push forward their ideas. Um, I will also say though, we are, we had a um, um, undergrad or two maybe in the past year, but we we are wondering how do you involve more undergrads in this or how do we reach out, out our, our um, feelers or tentacles a little bit more? That's an open question to us too. Sure. Um, I have to say this, that my first day of my doctoral seminar, Rebecca, you were in the class last year, this year, one student unsolicited said that what has transformed the graduate education was being part of your LFC. Uh, so Kevin Brown said that, and I sat there and I was like, okay, I did not pay him money to say that. And that's awesome, made me really happy uh, to, to hear that. So um, Aaron, uh, any thoughts on, on that? I know you have hired a grad student, but how do you seek to include more grad doctoral students in this? 
Well, we the the grad student we hired actually is a master student. Um, she, um, because all our our doc students are very busy. <laughs> we yes. keep them very busy. Um, but we do have four or five that are involved in in the research side of it and and doing some really cool things. And I think you know a lot of it ends up being word of mouth. But Kathy, I think you went and presented to our doc students too. Um, in a in a meeting, and I think it's you know it's just getting to know what the possible abilities are and and then them having opportunities to to know that you know there's there's lots of projects going on in one place i think it's a little easier for for people to jump in than um than when it's just you know one faculty one student and and you're working on that one project so um you know there's there's a lot of uh of different qualitative, quantitative, uh, interview, you know, data collection aspects versus data analysis, um, you know, community activities. So I think there's kind of something for everyone now, but um, the more, the more we're able to talk about it, the better <laughs> they get to get, get involved. Yeah. One of the things we have seen in the AI LFC is that, that it's genuine sort of legitimate peripheral participation. So there is no obligation that you do X or Y. Uh, but as projects come along, you say, hey, I would like to help with that. And then you try to fit in as much as is possible with your existing uh, work that's going on. And I think that's been very fruitful. Um, so any other thoughts on that before? I think we are getting close on time. With Betty, you want to kick us off the last question? Or Rebecca, is there something you wanted to add? Yeah, sorry, just one more thing. And I was just from what the two of you just said, thinking that I think it's always important to have this learner contributor uh, identity and relationship. And if if everybody can be a learner and a contributor, so I go in as a grad student and I'm definitely a learner, but if I also have just something I can contribute. And I like also, Punya, that you said, like, you don't necessarily have to do anything because that's also nice, right? It's nice to be able to participate without having to do a lot of, a lot of committing without committing I should say to begin with but if everybody both the professors and the students can have that learner contributor mindset and and the freedom to be both learners and contributors I think that makes it um, a robust experience for for more people thank you great yeah well we just have a few minutes left and but this is a good question to wrap up on so what advice do you all have for anyone else who is thinking of or would like to start an LFC or even join an LFC? Um, Rebecca, why don't I just turn right to you since you're already speaking? Any tips for people who are interested in an LFC? I really actually, I this is one that is hard for me to speak to and the, because I don't, I don't know, but I guess I would say you start to talk, maybe you think about what you're interested in and like, what are the driving things, the things that are driving you and that you're really interested in. But I wonder if it's even like, if it's periphery to you, but you realize there might be other people for whom it's their main focus, trying to kind of network to those people and see if you can create a, a larger sort of web or network of, of interested and curious people. Um, I think it, that network idea is important because there'll be some people who have really strong ties to the and commitments to whatever the topic is. And there might be some with looser, but it allows the network to grow to have both and all types um, in different disciplines. But that's, Great. I'd like to hear more from, Ka from Kathy yeah. and Aaron. Kathy and Aaron. Um, well, I strongly encourage the creation of more LFCs. Um, I think it's such a great opportunity to have a multidisciplinary group and, and I do think there is such opportunity to for ASU's work to be more informed by the community and, and pra practitioners, but also, you know, we have, like I said, parents, business leaders, nonprofit leaders. So um, having diverse perspectives at the ta table has been incredibly helpful. And so my advice is, um, is actually is to talk to, I, I found it was helpful for me to talk to the other LFC leaders before we kicked off. And that helped me to see more clearly how each one operates completely differently from one another. So it, it helps open my eyes to how much flexibility and opportunity there is. And then um, when I heard in that um, second year kickoff meeting, when I heard about all the accomplishments of the other LFCs from their first year, that was also incredibly inspirational. So I think if there's even more we can do to elevate those projects and accomplishments from the LFCs, then people will see what's possible and maybe feel more enthusiastic about creating LFCs and joining LFCs. Thanks. Erin, anything to add? Um, I would just say, you know, 
The biggest thing that an LFC allows you to do is look at your commonalities, even when on the surface, it doesn't seem like you have them. Um, and I think, you know, I, I've switched fields a few times from related disciplines, but not the same and realized that people aren't talking to each other, all these. And so the more I've done that, you know, the people that I work with here now, if if I, I like the things that they're doing or I like the person and what they're inspired um, about, I'll find the commonalities and go and build projects around those. So um, so I think that the key is, is really connecting and finding um, a bigger purpose that encompasses both of what you do. Great. I just have to add that all of you are great advertisements for the LFCs, thinking of that. Talk about being inspirational and being blown away by everything that you're doing. So thanks so much again for, for joining us. Punya, any additional last words or comments? No, just thank you uh, for joining, for all the work that you do. Um, it's it's awesome. And it makes me very happy, just speaking personally, <laughs> to see all this awesome stuff. <laughs> And um, I just wanted to add one thing. Um, I got an email from Andrea Weinberg uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. The Their LFC now has a sub stack uh, called Education for Planetary Futures, which you mm -hmm. must completely go and sign up for. Um, they are actually quite amazing in posting very regularly, which is always a stress point for me whenever I think about starting something like a sub stack. Every time I toy with an idea, I like back off saying like, I'm not sure I can sustain it, but they've been doing a fabulous job. They also have an Instagram, both of which are in the chat right now. So awesome on that. So just wanted to congratulate uh, the, the the globalization and sustainability LFC around that. So that's, that's great. And then next week um, we have at, at ASU, we now have this new institution organization unit. I have no idea what it's called. It's called the Learning Engineering Institute. Danielle McNamara is leading it with Scotty Craig and Rod Roscoe um, involved with it as well. Um, they have a whole variety of different projects that they're kicking off. And so Danielle, um, if you don't know her, is one of the world's most reputed sort of cognitive scientists, learning science uh, people. And so this is a new initiative that they've kicked off and uh, they will be here. I know at least uh, Scotty and uh, Daniel will be here for sure. Scotty, I've tried to convince him to skip a faculty meeting, which I think is incentive enough. <laughs> uh, so he might show up. I mean, he might be a little late, but he said he will show up. Rod, I haven't heard back from, but I think it will be a very informative session about uh, uh, an interesting initiative that's developing here at ASU. So looking forward to seeing you then. And we're exactly at the hour. So thank you. Just a minor correction. They'll be joining us in two weeks. Next ah. week is a holiday. So we won't be seeing anyone next week. Enjoy um, enjoy your Friday off. So, but oh. yeah, looking forward to that session for sure, Punya, in a couple of weeks. All so right. great. Um, perfect. We're still at one o'clock. So thanks everyone for joining us. And thanks to our discussants. Great conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank Good you. to see you. Thanks.